Okay, hi everyone. Uh, great to be here. So, um, yeah, I'm Ben, the CEO and co-founder of 80,000 Hours. And yeah, here's one of the most powerful ways to have more impact with your career. And, and that is working with a great community. So one reason for that is that it's really motivating. If you're around people who want to help others, then that changes the social norms and makes you more keen to contribute. Another thing is it's kind of like networking on steroids. If you meet one person in the community who can then vouch for you to everyone else, then you can make hundreds of connections at once. And then the third thing is what I want to talk about more today, is that you can trade and coordinate with the rest of the community. So let's suppose uh, I want to say build and sell a piece of software. One approach would be for me to go and like, learn all the things I need myself, engineering, management, marketing, um, but I probably wouldn't get that far. A much better approach would be to instead form a team of people who are specialists in each area and then build it and, and sell it together. And then, although I'll then have to share the, the profits with um, other people, the total size of the gains will be much larger. So overall, we'll all win and we'll all be better off. What's going on under this is, firstly, we've got division of labor. So by specializing, we can each become much better at the individual skills uh, and therefore more productive as a group. Another thing is that we can share fixed costs. So um, we can all share the same company registration. We can same, share the same operational procedures. It's not three times harder to fundraise as much as three times as much money from an angel investor. And then this allows us to achieve economies of scale. And in total, we've got what's called the gains from trade. So um, yeah, a, an interesting thing about trade is that you can do it with people even if you don't particularly share their values, even if you don't have a common common aim. So here's a purely hypothetical example. Suppose um, I run a global poverty charity, and uh, I meet someone who runs an animal welfare charity, and I don't think animal welfare is a very pressing problem, so I don't think their project has much impact. And then it turns out they feel exactly the same way about me. So neither of us thinks each other's project has much impact. But then consider, maybe I know a donor who isn't going to donate to my charity, but might be interested in donating to them. So I can make an introduction to uh, that donor to the other charity. This is just a small cost to me, but it might be a really huge deal to them. And then suppose they could do the same. Maybe they know, they know another donor. And so then we could trade. And this means we end up with a situation where we both get a large benefit for a small cost to ourselves. So we've both been made better off relative to our own aims. Now, yeah, this is why 100 people working together can have much more impact uh, than 100 people doing individually what seems best. Now, what I've said so far applies to any community that you might want to get involved with. And there's lots of great communities out there. Uh, but I know many people who feel like getting involved with the effective altruism community has been a particularly big boost to their, their impact and, and their career and so on. And why, why, why might that be? Well, I think although you can trade with people who don't particularly share your values, if you're in a community and you do share their values, then um, you don't even need to trade. So what do I mean by that? Well, so if I help someone else in the community have a greater impact, then I've also had a greater impact as well. So we've both achieved our goals. That means I don't even need to kind of try and like make sure that if I do someone a favor, I get a favor back from them later, which would be trading. Instead, I can just help the other person, and that's already having a social impact. Um, yeah, so this unleashes all kinds of opportunities to work together that just wouldn't be efficient in a community where we didn't share as, uh, values um, as much. Uh, like, technically, we're reducing the transaction costs and principal agent problems um, involved with working together. So here's an example. Uh, we don't normally think about it like this, but actually, earning to give can be a, an example of coordination. So back in the early days of 80,000 Hours, we needed someone to run the organization, and we needed funding. And there were two of us, uh, me and someone called Matt, who were considering working at 80,000 Hours. But we realized that Matt had much higher earning potential than me, while I would be better, better suited to running 80,000 Hours, at least hopefully. So what happened is that Matt went to earn to give and became one of our largest early donors while I um, went to run 80,000 Hours. Matt also ended up seed funding several other new charities. So alternatively, we could have both earned to give, 
in which case 80,000 hours would have never existed. Or we could have both gone and worked at 80,000 hours, in which case it would have been much harder to fundraise early on, so we would have grown more slowly. And those other charities wouldn't have benefited. So then thinking about the community as a whole, there's going to be some people who are like Matt, and they're relatively best suited to earning money. And we can have a greater impact as a group if those people earn to give and then fund everyone else to do direct work. Um, and so in these ways, by working together, we all have the potential to achieve far more if we work together as a group than we could. But I don't think we actually do work together maybe as effectively as we could a lot of the time. So effective altruism encourages us to ask what individual actions are highest impact. And some critiques of the community have suggested this could make us biased. So this is perhaps the most uh, well-known critique of this kind from the London Review of Books. Um, so there was a small paradox in the growth of the effect of altruism as a movement when it is so profoundly individualistic. The tacit assumption is that the individual, not the community, class, or state is the proper object of moral theorizing. Now, Professor McMahon at Oxford had a response to this uh, article, which I agree with. So he said, I am neither a community nor a state. I can determine only what I will do, uh, not what my community or state will do, though I can, of course, decide to concentrate my individual efforts on changing my state's institutions. And I think that's absolutely right in the sense, like, I'm an individual, so ultimately all I have control over is what my individual actions are and, and, and what their impact is going to be. But I also think there's truth in the, the criticism in the London Review of Books um, that although um, maybe individual actions are ultimately what matters, we still have to be wary of the biases in that perspective. If we ask the question of which individual actions are highest impact, then it might cause us to overlook things that might actually have a greater impact, that might, might overlook individual actions that would actually have a greater impact. And so in particular, I often see people in the community taking what I call um, a narrow single player analysis, uh, making a narrow single player analysis of their options. Um, not fully factoring in the relevant counterfactuals, not thinking about how the community will adjust to their actions. And while this might have worked when we didn't really have a community, nowadays it doesn't work so well. Instead, we need to adopt what I call a multiplayer perspective. Um, and so that breaks down into these two things, which I'm going to cover over the rest of the talk. Firstly, we need new rules of thumb for choosing between our actions. And then secondly, there's new options that become worth considering when there's a community involved. OK, and these will just be some rough ideas from our, from our latest research. So firstly, how to choose between our options. I'm just going to consider just a single question of, should I work at some charity in the community, like Against Malaria Foundation, GiveWell, CEA, or so on? So, OK, Amy is considering taking a job in the community. What will her impact be? Uh, now, the naive view of that might just be, well, the job is high impact, so if Amy takes the job, then Amy will have a big impact. But then you hear about effective altruism, and someone says, ah, but if you take the job, then Bob will take it. If you don't take the job, Bob will take it instead. And so therefore, Amy won't have much impact. In fact, it would only be worth Amy taking the job if she was going to be much better at it than, job, than Bob. OK, but, and so I call that the simple analysis of replaceability. And it's an example of a single player kind of style of thinking. And it leads to lots of people thinking they shouldn't do direct work, but instead should earn to give. But I think this is wrong. And I apologize, because it's partly our fault for talking loosely about the simple uh, analysis of replaceability back in the early days of 80,000 hours. But today, I want to try and stamp it out. <laughs> so first problem is, you might not actually be replaced. There's a chance that the charity just wouldn't hire anyone otherwise. And in fact, this often seems to be true. So when we talk to charities in the community, they often have positions they've been trying to fill for a while but haven't been able to fill. One reason for this, one cause that's driving this, is that there's donors who want to support the community with money on the sidelines. And that means that if you're a charity that finds someone who's worth hiring, then you can just fundraise extra money to hire that person. And so this creates a situation where you have threshold hiring, where anyone who's above a bar can get hired because you just raise more money to cover that person. Um, and so then all those people are not replaceable. In fact, I think there's a bunch of other ways you can end up not being replaceable, um, such as through supply-demand effects, um, which we cover elsewhere. 
this actually means that you can end up being pretty valuable to the organization that you're working at. Um, one way to estimate how much impact you might have at the organization is to ask them to make this trade-off. So you say, well, I could either work for you or I could donate X dollars per year to you. At what value of X would you be indifferent, roughly? And it's just a way of gauging the um, relative impact of um, your, you working there. And so we actually did this with 12 organizations in the community last summer. And these were the figures, some of the figures that came out. And this is all pretty rough. But, um, and also, yeah, there's reasons to think the organizations might be biased upwards, right? But uh, I think it at least suggests that because these figures are much more than most people would be able to donate, um, that these people are having a greater impact than they would through earning to give. We also just asked the organizations how talent versus funding constrained do they think they are, and you can see there's a clear tilt towards being talent constrained. The, the interesting exception is uh, the animal charities report being more funding constrained relative to the others. Okay, so the first problem with the simple view of replaceability was you might not actually be replaced. The second problem is um, where the community really comes in, and that's what I call spillovers. So suppose um, Amy takes job one, um, and she would have been replaced. Someone else would have taken the job anyway. But by taking job one, that means that Amy actually then frees up someone else to go and do job two. Now, if you were just considering a job that would be filled um, by someone who doesn't really care about social impact anyway, and would just go and do some, like, maybe some random job in the corporate sector, which you don't think it has much impact, then you can kind of safely ignore the spillover. Um, but in the current community, it's not so obvious you can ignore it. Probably this person, Bob, would also be concerned by social impact and would go and do some other high impact thing. Uh, they might earn to give, they might work at another uh, charity in, in, the, in the community. Um, so this is actually then a significant component of the, of the impact. In fact, I think this kind of case is not even a hypothetical example. I've actually seen cases where someone didn't take job one because they thought they'd be replaceable. Um, but then that actually meant that someone had to be pulled out of job two to go and take job one instead, where job two was a similarly important role as, as job one. OK, so taking into account these spillovers, then what is the impact of taking a job? How, how do we analyze it? And um, yeah, I think this is actually still an unsolved problem. But here's a kind of sketch of our current thinking. So basically, if Amy takes job one, then she frees up someone else to do job two, who then frees up someone else to do job three, and it causes a chain of replacements. Um, where does the chain end? There's kind of two main endings it could have. One is that someone goes into a job that wouldn't have been filled otherwise, a threshold hiring situation, and then it stops. Or it can keep going until you hit the marginal opportunity, so the best job that wouldn't have been taken otherwise. Um, and so that means that at worst, even if Amy was fully replaceable, at worst, she'd be adding someone to the margin of the community, which would still be a significant impact. So um, this, is, this shows that the simple analysis of replaceability is actually underestimating it in both of the, the cases we've, we've covered. OK, so firstly, knocking out someone to the margin. Secondly, hopefully, you're enabling all these people to then switch into jobs that are a slightly better fit for them, because um, they'll be choosing jobs that are um, like slightly better. Um, Amy's like taking job one because she's a better fit for that one, and then that's freeing up Bob to go and do something else that's a better fit for him. So there's p potentially another benefit as well that the community gets to a better allocation overall. Yeah, I think if we zoom out a bit, when you're working in a community, the picture is more like this one, where we have a pool of thousands of roles and there's a, then thousands of people. And from the community's perspective, you want to match the people um, into the ideal allocation over those roles. And then from an individual point of view, the question then becomes, what can I do to move the community towards that ideal allocation? And that becomes the highest impact role for me. And I think the key concept here is comparative advantage compared to the rest of the community. So comparative advantage can be a bit counterintuitive, so I'm just going to explore that in a little bit more depth. 
So suppose the, the community needs two more roles at the margin. It needs someone doing research, it needs someone doing outreach. If Charlie did research, then uh, he would have two units of impact, uh, whereas if he did outreach, he'd have one unit of impact. And then Dora would have 10 and one. So then the question is, what is the best allocation? So there's two possibilities, and the best one is this one, where Dora does research and, and Charlie does outreach, because 10 plus one is bigger than two plus two. Um, but what's weird about this example is that Charlie is actually worse at outreach uh, than he is at research. And he's also worse at outreach than Dora is at outreach. So in no sense does he have an absolute advantage, or even you might even want to say he doesn't have good personal fit with outreach. Um, but nevertheless, it's the highest impact thing for him to do. And that's because he has a comparative advantage in outreach. Um, basically, he is relatively less bad at outreach than Dora is. Um, as we saw, the simple analysis of replaceability encourages you to only do a job if you're better than the person who would have replaced you in that job. Though actually, here's an example of something where you should do something that you're actually worse at, because then it enables the community to achieve the best overall um, allocation. I actually have a suspicion that an example like this might even be a real example. So lots of people in the community reason, well, I'm good at analytical things, so I should probably do research. Uh, but that doesn't actually follow. What actually matters is how good you are at research compared to the um, other people who might do research and outreach. If we have lots of good analytical people but few outreach people, then even though you might be good at research compared to people in general, you might have a comparative advantage in outreach. Something similar seems maybe true in operations roles compared to research roles. And maybe also in t with earning to give. So people sometimes say, well, I have high earning potential, so therefore I should earn to give. But again, that doesn't follow. What actually matters is your earning potential relative to others who might do direct work. Um, if it's high relative to them, then you should earn to give. But if the other people doing direct work would also have high earning potential, then you might still have a, a comparative advantage in direct work. Um, unless, of course, you're Chuck Norris, who has a comparative advantage in everything. <laughs> so how can you find your comparative advantage in real cases? I think basically it boils down to ask people in charge of hiring at the, at the organizations about your relative strengths and weaknesses. OK, so summing up, how do you analyze the impact of taking a job? So firstly, you probably cause some boost to the organization. You're not fully replaceable. And then you can try and ask them about it or estimate it yourself by asking them to trade donations against uh, you working there. Secondly, you cause some spillover effect, potentially, to the rest of the community. And then the question is, um, is that role above the bar for the community as a whole? And does it play to my comparative advantage? Are you getting the community towards a be better overall allocation? OK, and then just to say, I think similar considerations apply to donating as well. So I sometimes see people say, well, I shouldn't donate to Charity One because someone else would donate there instead, and so I'll be replaceable. I won't actually have much impact. But then I think a whole kind of similar analysis applies. So firstly, you probably won't be fully replaceable. Not all the money would have been given otherwise to that charity. And especially if you consider over time. So maybe the money would have been given otherwise, but with a delay, which would slow down the charity. And then secondly, even if it is fully replaced, then you're still just then freeing up some other donor in the community to go and donate somewhere else, which would probably be somewhere reasonably high impact as well. OK, so there's a lot more to say about that. Um, and there's a bit more detail in this article online called The Value of Coordination. OK, so that was all about the new rules of thumb. The new rules of thumb for choosing between your options. But being part of a community also changes your career by opening up new options that might not be um, on the table if you were just thinking from a single player point of view. The EA mindset, however, with a focus on individual actions, can lead us to neglect paths that allow us to have an impact through helping others do more because the impact is less salient. But now that there's thousands of effective altruists, at least, the highest impact for you, option for you could well be one that just involves helping others have more impact. Um, boosting others. And so I'm just going to give five examples. And these aren't exhaustive or exclusive, but they're just some ideas. So first one is five-minute favors. So we all have different strengths and weaknesses, knowledge and resources. 
And now that there's thousands of people involved, there's probably lots of small ways that we can help others have much more impact that are very little cost to ourselves. And so I call those five-minute favors, which is just a term from Adam Grant. And that means these kinds of things are really worth looking for. So do you know a job that needs filling? Uh, there's a good chance that there's someone in this room or at this conference who would be a good fit for that job. And if you could make an introduction, that might only take you an hour, but it would help them for years. Or there's probably someone in this room who has a problem that um, you know how to solve. You know someone who's solved it before, you know a book that could help them solve it, and, and so on. Okay, so right now, I want everyone to turn to their left, and, okay, just kidding, sorry, I'm British, we don't do that kind of, we don't do that kind of conference stuff, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so, second example. <laughs> Operations roles in general. So, Kyle uh, moved to Oxford and ended up becoming Nick Bostrom's assistant. And he thought, if I can save Nick Bostrom some time, then that will enable more research and outreach to be done, which um, I actually think could be a really high impact. Instead, people often feel like these operations roles are replaceable by someone from outside of the community. Um, but actually, because you have to make lots of little decisions in these roles um, that require quite a good understanding of the aims of the organization, uh, they're, they're often actually very hard to outsource um, and hard to replace. Okay, third example, community infrastructure becomes much more valuable the larger the community. So for instance, having a job board isn't really needed when there's just 100 people, but when there's thousands of people, then it can play quite a useful role, which is why we added one uh, to the 80,000 hours site a few months ago. So by community infrastructure, I mean anything that helps make the community coordinate more efficiently, such as this event, um, or it could even mean stuff like setting up good norms of communication um, that make it easier to work together, like stating the evidence for your, always stating the evidence for your views, or just being nice. If you can help 1,000 people have 1% more impact, then that's like having the impact of 10 people. On the other hand, it means if you do something destructive, then you ruin it for everyone else. Fourth category is sharing knowledge with the community. So the more people there are in the community, the more worthwhile it is to do research into what the community should do, um, and then sharing it with everyone else, because then there's just more people who can act on the findings, so that the value of new information is higher. Um, so an example of this is just writing up reports on areas that we have special knowledge of. And so these were some examples recently from the Effect Altruism Forum. So for instance, Lee Sharkey is a public health consultant to the World Health Organization, and he wrote up some ideas for a new cause area, which is increasing access to pain relief in developing countries. It can also mean that it's sometimes worth going and learning about areas that don't seem like the highest priority, but just might turn out to be. In a smaller community, um, this exploration wouldn't be worth the time, but as we become larger, it becomes more and more worth it. Okay, the fifth and final example is specialization. So if the community were just a couple of people, then we'd all need to become generalists. But in a community of 10,000 people, then we can all become experts in our individual areas um, and therefore be more than 10,000 time, 10, times as productive as an individual. And this is just the division of labor like we mentioned right at the start with the software example. So for instance, Dr. Greg Lewis did our research into how many lives a doctor saves. And this convinced him that his greatest impact wouldn't come through his direct clinical practice. So instead he decided to go and do a master's in public health. And part of the reason for that was because it's an important area for the community, especially around pandemics. But there's a lack of people with that skill set. Greg actually thinks that um, AI risk might be a higher priority in general, but as a doctor, he has a comparative advantage in doing public health. So right now, I and many others think that one of the greatest weaknesses of the community is a lack of specialist expertise um, and knowledge, like we're all pretty young and inexperienced. And so these are just some areas that um, I, I'd like to highlight, but not gonna go over right now. Okay, so summing up everything, when choosing whether to take a job or donate somewhere, don't just assume that it's, you're replaceable. Rather, ask the organization about how big the boost would be, or try and estimate it yourself. Consider the trade-off between donations um, and working there. And then secondly, consider the spillover benefits and whether the, the role plays to your comparative advantage. And then look for ways, uh, new options that come available. Doing five-minute favors, operations roles in general, setting up better community infrastructure, gaining and sharing knowledge with the rest of the community, uh, and uh, specialization. 
So we still have a lot to learn about how best to work together, and I think there's a lot more we could do. But I really believe that if we do work together effectively, then in our lifetimes, we can make a major impact on reducing catastrophic risks, eliminating factory farming, reducing global poverty, and many other issues. Okay, so how to learn more. There's gonna be uh, more detail on some of these topics on this talk on Sunday. And then over the rest of today, we're running three more talks as part of our advanced workshop track. Um, so firstly, we're gonna be considering what are some of the highest impact opportunities in the community right now? And then how do you narrow those down and figure out what the best and highest impact career option is for you? And then finally, we've got drop-in careers advice where we're gonna try and resolve some of your remaining questions and find a high impact career. So thanks for listening. <laughs>